Swinburne University of Technology. I've been asked to do the sort of the item one doing DGR perspective on this. Um, and just as you were talking, the one word that resonated in my head the whole time is purpose. So transparency in itself, you know, is, it's a means to an end. It's all about the purpose. It's all about why would you use that as a tool? And for me, it's about actually driving the kind of social change that we're all in this to see. So I thought I'd, I'll just talk briefly about three things and then I'll finish with a very current personal anecdote slash dilemma slash transparency question. <laughs> the first thing when I sat down to think about this is well okay what is transparency and, and what does it look like? Second question is why is it important and I think you know we've heard a lot about that and then the third question I asked myself well okay well why is it an issue? What encourages or discourages it and what is the best way to make it happen? So I'll confess and out myself as a transparency advocate so that's the perspective I'm going to come from. So to start then, I always think it's always good to be clear about what I'm talking about, so some sort of definition. So transparency to me is an obligation or a willingness by, in this case, a non-profit organisation to publish and make available critical data about the organisation. But I think transparency on its own actually isn't enough. I think that it's very close sibling accountability has got to be in there as well. So if you've only got transparency, you've only got half, I think, of your muscles working. You actually need the other half with it, which is the accountability. So to me, accountability is the obligation or the willingness to explain our actions to stakeholders. This includes all the fiduciary information, the action by charities, the results reporting, and all of the meaningful indicators about the way the organisations use resources and how they accomplish their mission. And I think that is as apt to a philanthropic trust or organisation or individual as it is to an organisation that uses the philanthropy to drive social change. So if an organisation is being transparent, what is it doing? How do we know that it's being transparent and how do we know that it's opening itself up to be accountable? So the US charity Navigator is a, is a rating system that assesses the degree of transparency and accountability of non-profit organisations in the US. And it splits its criteria into two parts. The first part is that data that is publicly available to anybody, anywhere at any time. And the second set of information is information that it makes available to people when they ask for it. The first lot, exactly what we've seen here on the slides, it's around board staff profiles, who they are, what their interests are, um, are there independent directors, what are the audited financial statements and accounts, what's the privacy policy. But the information that they also look for to be made available are things like board minutes, conflict of interest policy, whistleblower policy, records retention and destruction policy, which I thought was really interesting, the CEO remuneration policy, um, explanation of any unusual transactions, so is there a material diversion of assets, what does that mean, and evidence that there are no loans to or from offices or interested parties. And in Australia, PricewaterhouseCoopers has been running the Nonprofit Sector Transparency Awards. It's been running that since 2007 and the two nonprofit organisations I have worked for, so REACH and, and the Australian Communities Foundation, in both organisations we have tried to put ourselves in the mix to be assessed against that. We have yet to win, but we will one day. Um, now these criteria have been developed from their own reporting framework, from the Institute of Chartered Accountants reporting framework and from the Global Reporting Initiative. And again, they look at things like information about the organisation, also then around the business strategy. So information that people sometimes are quite private and um, protective about, you know, that fear of of letting that IP go. They look for obviously governance structure, they look for activity performance and finance. So I think it's really easy to collate what everybody has said around if people are being transparent or if organisations are being transparent, what does it look like? John also ran through why is it important? Um, and I think, I suspect I'm here in danger of sucking eggs because I think everybody has answered that. But from a from a doing organisation perspective, I fundamentally believe that we are for and of the community. 
that we are actually owned by and responsible to the community and we all operate with gifts with time, with knowledge, with money, with assets, with goodwill, with energy, with emotion. And I think that we can only exist sustainably and legitimately if there is genuine public trust and confidence in our sector and in each of the organisations that make up that sector. And so sometimes it's easy to describe what something looks like when it's not there. And I love this definition of community organisations when transparency isn't there and this is as defined by our community and they say at their worst community organisations are inward, exclusive, elitist, hierarchical, clogged up um, in with the same old faces. They can be racist, sexist, ageist, intolerant of disability, homophobic. They can exclude new blood and new visions. These groups do not support the development of social capital, nor do they promote well-being. And then the corollary is, they say, organisations that follow good governance and transparency practices are less likely to engage in unethical or irresponsible activities. And so the risks that such organisations would misuse their funds is lower than for charities that don't adopt such practices. So people expect information. And if they don't get it, they'll be dissatisfied. And we know that when there is a void, people will fill it. And so if, if donors or funders are unlikely to complain, they are, however, likely to jump to conclusions as to why there's a lack of transparency. And that leads us into, I think, John, you, you touched on this, you know, assumptions about incompetence, about wastage, about conspiracy theories. All those assumptions thrive on lack of transparency and accountability, and that's what hurts this sector. So transparency shed light, sheds light on our practices, I think it absolutely incentivises ethical, efficient and effective operation and it without doubt facilitates oversight by the public and others. So why then are people reluctant to be transparent? Uh, and my thinking there are three kind of clusters of things that um, uh, disable transparency or make it hard. The first um, category that I've, I've sort of clustered them into are what I call external issues. So things that are in the ecosystem that we live in that make it hard to be transparent. The next cluster of issue I think are internal issues, internal to organisations and I think Jen you touched on this. These are issues to do with our capacity and our resourcing and our reasoning. And then the third cluster of issues are also internal, but I think they're different and I think they're attitudinal. And that's the cluster I, I, I really struggle to understand. So going back to the first one, external. So the ecosystem that we live in. Within um, Australia, there are currently more than 20 ways of incorporating in some way, shape or form non-profit organisations. We still have different funding legislation in every, sp every state, despite a number of years of it being on the COAG agenda. The definitions that we've used for data collection and reporting are still inconsistent. Um, so ACOS at the moment is giving an example of there's a family services agency in Queensland. It has 32 service agreements across federal and state government agencies. To, to, in order to fulfil that, it needs to operate eight separate data systems and generate 121 financial reports and 125 performance reports each year. Well, that is crap. I mean, really. <laughs> so, you know, we talked about a common language, common definitions. You know, community service agencies, welfare organisations report that information flow is largely one way, particularly with government funding. It goes into government. There's very little analysis and feedback to allow for benchmarking and for service delivery improvements. And um, one commentator has described it as a pathetic hodgepodge of regulation. So in the Productivity Commission, the most recent one, the 2011 Productiv Productivity Commission report described it as the current regulatory framework for the sector is complex, lacks coherence, sufficient transparency and is costly. So for information to be meaningful and comparable, we have to have a common approach to reporting, we have to have common and clear definitions, and we have to understand the context each time we look at data. And we have to understand the context within which that data sits. So we know that many of those issues are, st are starting to be addressed. We know that the motivation behind the ACNC is all around building that common language 
Andy out of Deakin is also trying to contribute to that. So we know that there are a number of initiatives. Um, but it's interesting, and I think, Mike, you raised this. There is controversy around regulation and how effective regulation is on driving transparency. And there's a, there are a number of arguments, particularly coming out of places like Germany and Netherlands and Sweden, where they say actually self-reporting through regulation won't be effective in dealing with this. And what we actually need are certification agencies or more active agents in the system driving this in a much more kind of chemical and active way. So the second set of um, I think barriers to transparency are those internal resource barriers and I think Jen you touched on this too. This is about underinvestment in basic IT, financial and other infrastructure resources. That's really common in nonprofits. Um, it's about our capacity. You know, outcomes measurement is complex. You know, how do we measure it? How do we make it meaningful? Um, certainly in the, um, the doing organisation space, you know, there's this constant refrain, well, no one wants to pay for it. Um, and generally these things are challenging because they need resources we either don't have or because we are reluctant to redirect them from areas that we see as more important. And they're also challenging though, I think, because of the intellectual rigour and thinking that's needed to determine the best and most meaningful tools. That's, it's hard thinking stuff, it makes my head hurt. Um, and so the structure and the language to be effective has got to be simple yet meaningful. And then that third set of barriers, which are also internal, which I think is attitudinal, and this is the one I really struggle with. And um, just as a little aside, oh, I know you're taping this and I, I, I won't be rude, but, well, maybe I will be. There's a, <laughs> and this isn't about being personal. There was um, an email that went out from Philanthropy Australia to its members, and it's here on my phone. It's called Policy Alert. Um, and it says, Philanthropy Australian members should be aware that new regulations came into effect on the 17th of June. The ACNC regulation has been amended to allow PAFs to request that the ACNC withhold or remove certain information from pa about PAFs from the ACNC register. Um, and basically what this email does is encourage PAFs to register with the ACNC that they do not want this information to be made publicly available because, and there was one line in here as to why, it was a very long email, and the one line that said as to why, because it is likely to identify individual donors or cause unreasonable administrative burden. And I, I just think as, a, as the, the national membership body that is about growing and encouraging philanthropy and then about making philanthropy more exciting and successful, we should be looking at ways of using transparency as the tool that it is to get there as opposed to encouraging people to put it in a black box with the lid on the top. So sorry, that was a little rant on the aside. Back to the third cluster of issues, the attitudinal issues. I, am I? <laughs> yeah, not inside. <laughs> okay. What I hear in organisations like mine is, and, and I quote, this was from a meeting I was at a, a couple of weeks ago with some colleagues, why are we stuffing around with the administration and bureaucracy of reporting when we should be out there delivering the services when there's so much demand? You know, we have real attitudinal barriers internally. We also hear, what's it got to do with them? It's none of their business. And we also people, well, if we show people this information, they won't understand and they will judge us. And I think that's the key. It's this fear of judgment. Organisations like mine must be, tra I believe, must be transparent and must prioritise the work that it takes us to get there. But to do this, we've really got to have confidence. We've got to have confidence in ourselves and in our organisations and in our proposition. We've got to have the courage of our own convictions so that when we are challenged and questioned, which we should be, we can actually respond coherently and logically and with evidence. And if we can't respond coherently, logically and with evidence, then we have got a lot more work to do. So challenge and question, it has to be respectful and it's about growing and it's about purpose. But if we can't put the compelling proposition together, then we've just got a lot more work to do. 
We need all our colleagues within our organisation to understand why we need to do, be transparent. We need to get on and do it, regardless of the external <coughs> regime and the tools there or not. And we need to make the case, I think, to philanthropy better as to why it is worthy of that investment, both to help us build our capacity through funding, but also to partner us in philanthropies capacity building. And so the, the, the final point is a, is a very topical question that's going on within my organisation at the moment. So we, uh, about a year and a half ago, commissioned a major piece of clinical research around um, the efficacy and the outcome of our programs in schools. So working with 15, 16 year olds, what actually is the impact on the work of those students' well-being and, and, and capacity to thrive? And we went into that research with two questions. The first one was, please show us what's working and where and how and what in the promises that we're saying or in our proposition that we're making, where can we actually validate that with this independent evidence? But the second question was, please show us where we're not hitting it, where we're not nailing it, where we're not getting it, and then please give us some ideas about how we actually go in and improve. So we asked the researchers those two questions. The research took a year, it was a huge piece of research. The report came out about five weeks ago, we got the final copy. And there is a debate going on about what we do with that full report. So I put it on the web and I sent an email out to everybody, all our donors, all our funders, all our supporters, all our participants, all their parents and said, we've had this report, here are the summary findings, click here if you want the full report, happy to talk to you, we'll run information sessions, the whole thing, because I fundamentally believe that's the right thing to do. But that is not a universal <laughs> response to that report. I am, I'm a bit buoyed up though because I met with the researcher today, the lead researcher, and she said, no, that's fantastic, do it. So I'm like, good, okay. And, and I understand the nervousness. It is complex, it's a clinical piece of research. I'm a lay person, it took me a long time to read it and understand all the charts and figures and statistics and what they were actually saying. So yes, you know, you do need to actually have some context around it. But if we um, shy back from all of that information, then what we lose is that trust and that partnership and that shared commitment to actually drive social change. So I believe that we actually have an, a fundamental ethical obligation to our constituents and to the public to conduct all our activities with accountability and with transparency. And yes, sometimes that will be hard, but that we should regularly and openly convey that information and that it should be accessible as and when people want to use it because without that we won't get the trust and we won't then be able to get the outcomes so here endeth my rant <laughs> this has been a swinburne production